We are honored to have Dr. Ann Zajcik provide today's lecture. Dr. Zajcik is a board certified pediatrician and a pediatric clinical pharmacologist who currently serves as deputy director of the Office of Clinical Research at the NIH. Ann received a bachelor degree in pharmacy from Duquesne University and a doctorate of pharmacy degree from State University of New York at Buffalo. She then completed postdoctoral fellowship training at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. After that, she served as assistant professor at the University of Colorado School of Pharmacy and a clinical pharmacist at National Jewish Hospital. In 1991, Ann entered medical school at the University of Pittsburgh. In 1998, completed residency in pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. She practiced primary care pediatrics for two years and then continued her training in pediatric clinical pharmacology at Stanford University. She subsequently joined the FDA's Office of Clinical Pharmacology and Biopharmaceutics. In 2003, she joined the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. We know you will enjoy Dr. Zajcik's lecture. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Ann Zajcik. I'm a pediatrician uh, clinical pharmacologist, and I will be speaking today about obstetric pharmacology. Uh, for disclosures, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and my presentation reflects my views only, not those of the NIH or the U.S. federal government. The topics I wanted to talk about today include medical conditions and medical uh, medication use in pregnancy, physiologic changes in pregnancy, drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters, both maternal and fetal, maternal fetal drug transfer, pharmacodynamic changes in pregnancy, medical conditions and medication use in pregnancy uh, regarding uh, fetal and maternal conditions teratogenicity and preclinical models, and research needs. I wanted to start first by talking about the medical conditions that occur in pregnancy. This will sort of set the stage for what I want to talk about. Uh, the conditions that are caused by or are coexisting in pregnancy include pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, preterm labor, gestational diabetes, depression, infections, pain, and nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. This is not all inclusive, but this is a fair number. Pre-existing medical conditions include hypertension, diabetes, depression, seizure disorder, cancer, endocrine disorders, substance abuse, and autoimmune disorders. This is a paper talking about the medication use uh, during pregnancy and the medication use just in the first trimester. And what's interesting here, as you can see that these curves from 1976 through 2008 show a rise not only in uh, the numbers of uh, medications that women are taking during the first trimester, but the number of medications that women are taking at any time during the pregnancy. And what had um, started at um, somewhere between one and two medications during the first trimester has now increased to somewhere between two and three medications in the first trimester. And at any time during the pregnancy from two to three medications in 1976, up to now between four and five medications during the pregnancy. And the next question is, what medications are women taking during pregnancy? And I've uh, put red boxes around the drugs that are not anti-infective. So you can see that the majority of medications that women are taking are anti-infectives, but you can also see there's a use of uh, pain medications such as codeine, hydrocodone, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, uh, medications for nausea and vomiting, I assume, uh, including promethazine and metoclopramide, as well as medications for asthma treatment. In terms of medication exposure, um, the CDC uh, indicated that about 4 million births took place in 2015. And anti-epileptic drugs are used in about 2.2% of pregnancies, yielding about 90,000 children who were exposed to anti-epileptic drugs. Asthma, 7%, 300,000 uh, fetuses exposed to asthma medications. Antidepressants, including the specific serotonin, excuse me, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, 6%, 
or about 240,000 fetuses exposed to uh, antidepressants. So there's a fair amount of fetal medication exposure. This is a paper from 2008 showing the obstetric drug pipeline. And what this paper showed was that there were vanishingly few new drugs being developed for obstetric indications. Um, the paper was very interesting. It compared uh, the number of drugs in the pipeline in, for obstetric conditions, cardiovascular conditions, in other words, high frequency conditions, and a myotrophic lateral sclerosis for a rare adult indication. And what you can see is that even though there are 4 million uh, births per year, there are only 17 new drugs being uh, developed for obstetric indications, 660 for cardiovascular indications, and 34 for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, again indicating that there are not many drugs in the pipeline for obstetric indications. Uh, this is another look at it, and this is a paper from uh, 20, let's see, where are we, 2016. So this is a new paper um, looking at the cost or the trial number comparing uh, trials of uh, medications for preterm birth against breast cancer, preeclampsia against lung cancer, and preeclampsia against inflammatory bowel disease. And you can see that in terms of the cost on the left side, the incidence of lung cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. The incidence is actually pretty similar. However, there's a really gross in, uh, difference between the number of trials for preterm birth, preeclampsia with, compared with lung cancer, and preeclampsia with inflammatory bowel disease. And in some ways, this does, in fact, reflect the previous slide that showed that there were vanishingly few new drugs being um, developed for obstetric indications. Okay, I'd next like to talk about physiologic and pharmacologic changes during pregnancy. This is a slide showing the uh, changes in hormonal concentrations during the period of gestation. And you can see the uh, beta HCG, estradiol, progesterone, which are all increasing during pregnancy, as well as relaxin. So you can see that this is a very scientifically, medically, hormonally complex situation during pregnancy. These are examples of physiologic changes in pregnancy. And essentially what's going on in pregnancy is this is a sort of a physiologic stress test during the nine months of gestation. So here we have, first of all, the uh, percentage change in cardiac output, stroke volume, and heart rate. And again, heart rate times stroke volume is cardiac output. And you can see that even um, very early in the pregnancy during the first trimester, there is a, a dramatic increase in cardiac output. In terms of maternal intravascular volume changes, again, the same thing, an increase in total blood volume, plasma blood volume, and so on. There are also dramatic changes in uh, renal function and renal elimination. There is increased filtration, uh, in part because of the increased cardiac output going to the kidney. Um, and there are also uh, increases in the function of transporters. So these transporters are moving drug actively from the circulation into uh, the proximal tubule into the urine. In terms of glomerular filtration rate and renal plasma flow in pregnancy, again, as we saw with the increase in cardiac output, uh, the percentage change in glomerular filtration rate and renal plasma flow, again, increases dramatically very early in the pregnancy and only after about six to eight weeks of uh, birth do, do the, does the glomerular filtration rate and renal plasma flow go back to postpartum values. Now you have to ask yourself, what is the clinical significance of this? This is a very interesting paper uh, by Mary, Mary Abrair from the University of Washington and her colleagues. Um, the study was supported by the FDA. So after 9-11, uh, the Postal Service started receiving packages of uh, letters contaminated with anthrax. And the concern was how to treat the people who were exposed to anthrax. And the question came up because of what we've just seen in terms of, of uh, renal clearance. 
uh, were the recommendations to treat pregnant women exposed to anthrax with amoxicillin valid or not valid? And what you can see is during the postpartum, as compared to the second and third trimester, that the maximum concentration and the area under the concentration curve in terms of the exposure of amoxicillin was significantly reduced in pregnant women. And the upshot of the paper was that they did a series of uh, modeling experiments trying to figure out what dose or what dosage interval would be appropriate for treating anthrax and the answer was none of them. So in other words, anthrax cannot be appropriately treated, will not, appropri will not be appropriately treated with amoxicillin in pregnancy. Okay, this is the effect of pregnancy on drug metabolism and GI motility. And what you can see here is that there are increased activities in some of the cytochrome uh, P450 enzymes and some of the glucuronosyl transferases, but decreased activity in others. There is also typically de decreased gastric emptying primarily because of the mass of the uterus. Now it's possible to measure the activity of those cytochromes using a cocktail approach, meaning that very small amounts of active drugs are given and then the concentrations are seen over time in order to see the specific activity of each individual cytochrome. Midazolam is a marker for cytochrome uh, P453A and what you're seeing is that during pregnancy the concentrations of midazolam are significantly decreased in relation to postpartum times indicating again that the cytochrome uh, P453A activity is significantly increased in pregnancy. Um, there have been other uh, situations where there's also been concern about increased metabolism during pregnancy and its clinical effect. So, uh, during pregnancy, there's a very high mortality rate in pregnant women who get the flu, either influenza A or influenza B. Uh, the treatment of choice for those uh, infections is Oseltamivir, which is Tamiflu in the United States. So this study was done to compare oseltamivir concentrations and its active metabolite, oseltamivir carboxylate, in pregnant and non-pregnant women. And what you can see is a similar curve pattern, that the non-pregnant women has, have higher concentrations of oseltamivir than the pregnant women. Now the question you have to ask yourself is, should there be a dosage adjustment here? And there's been a lot of discussion back and forth about whether it's necessary or not necessary. So that, is, that question is still out there. However, just to let you know that the um, pregnant versus the non-pregnant women have a significantly different uh, area under the curve and drug exposure for a drug to treat influenza. This is a recent paper that I thought was quite interesting. Um, at the moment, there is an opioid epidemic. And uh, this was a study looking at buprenorphine plasma concentrations during pregnancy and postpartum, again, showing a similar pattern, that in the first and second trimester, the concentrations of buprenorphine, which is used to treat women to avoid them going into narcotic or opioid withdrawal, are significantly lower than they are in postpartum. And the issue here is that um, the last thing you want a pregnant woman to do is to go into opioid withdrawal. This is a disaster for her health. It's a disaster for fetal health. And so the question that needs to be posed as a uh, follow-up to this study is, should the dose or the dosage interval be adjusted for women who are pregnant who require buprenorphine to avoid opioid withdrawal? Okay, so that's some information about pharmacokinetics. Now, the next question you have to ask yourself is, what are the pharmacodynamic changes that accompany the pharmacokinetic changes during pregnancy? And these are some nice uh, papers that were summarized by uh, Visca and Jusco um, about 10 years ago, looking at uh, differences in heparin, and its pharmacodynamic uh, outcome of change in uh, activated partial thromboplastin time in pregnant and non-pregnant women and nifedipine. And what you're seeing in these plots is that in uh, the above um, slide, the non-pregnant women have much higher 
uh, heparin concentrations than the pregnant women. And also in the second, uh, in B, you can see that the active uh, partial thromboplastin time is significantly higher. In other words, there's a stronger response in the non-pregnant versus the pregnant women. In the lower panel, you're seeing nifedipine concentrations against changes in systolic blood pressure in the yellow section of the non-pregnant and in B in the postpartum. And again, you're seeing the same sort of pattern where there's a decreased concentrations of nifedipine in the pregnant population as well as the significantly decreased pharmacodynamic response of a drop in blood pressure. Now, when you're talking about pregnancy, we're talking about the mother, but we're also talking about the fetus. So in terms of fetal drug transfer, which we're going to get to now, um, the concern is over the three trimesters of pregnancy. So in first trimester, there's embryogenesis and organogenesis. And this is the time that tends to be most sensitive to uh, drugs and specifically teratogenic potential of medications. In the second trimester, there's fetal maturation and growth, uh, which is even more dramatic in the third trimester where there's increased, again, fetal maturation and fetal growth. So how does drug get transferred from the maternal compartment into the fetal compartment? So on the left side of this picture is the fetus, head down, the umbilical cord, and the placenta which you can see is a blow up on the right. So this is a blow up of the placenta, and you can see the mother's blood vessels, the fetal blood vessels, and then the space in between. And the space in between is where the uh, drug is being transported or diffused across the maternal circulation to the fetal circulation and back again. So this is my uh, rudimentary uh, picture of what's going on here. So we have the maternal compartment on the right, the placenta in the middle, and the fetal compartment on the left. And we have diffusion. So some compounds diffuse back and forth. You can see the arrows going from the maternal to the fetal compartment and back again. And the diffusion takes place depending on some characteristics of the drug. It's also related to the blood flow. There's an increase in blood flow to the placenta, to the fetal compartment as the gestation continues. But in terms of the drug um, uh, properties, lipid solubility, molecular weight, protein binding, and ionization affect the ability of drug to go from, or to diffuse between one compartment and the other. So drugs that are very lipid soluble, for example, opioids, will flow freely between the maternal and fetal compartments. High molecular weight compounds will not move as easily. Highly protein bound compounds will not move as easily and drugs that are ionized tend to not move as freely either. In addition to diffusion, there's also active transport from the placenta to the fetal compartment and active count counter transport from the placental compartment back to the maternal compartment. In terms of fetal exposure, um, the fetus is continuing to grow during the gestation with increase in kidney function, increase in liver function, so ability to metabolize the drug through the liver, uh, the ability to renally excrete the drug through the kidney, and changes in the diffusibility of the drug going into the brain because the blood-brain barrier also has these sorts of barriers of active transport, active counter-transport. Okay. So again, just to reiterate, fetal drug exposure is related to the placental transport and counter-transport functions, as well as kidney function, hepatic function, and the maturity of the blood-brain barrier. This is very interesting. So I didn't know about this journal of visualized experiments, but this is a picture of the human placental perfusion model. So if you want to see in an in vitro way what compounds are going from the maternal circuit into the fetal circuit, you can obtain, after the consent of the mother, the human placenta and actually have it being perfused by uh, fluids in the maternal compartment going through the placenta into the fetal compartment. And if you look at this website, it's very interesting because the, the, um, the PI explains really nicely how to set up the experiment and so on. And this has become very useful because one of the questions you want to know is if you're giving a woman a drug, 
during the pregnancy, is it going to get to the fetal compartment? And is that good or not good? If it's chemotherapy, you probably don't want it to go to the fetal compartment, but there are situations where you actually want to treat the fetus through the maternal circulation. And so in this way, you can actually see what's going through the placenta and back again. Okay, so again, in addition to the diffusion of the drugs going back and forth, there are all these series of transporters that are responsible for efflux. For example, the MRP1 is an efflux transporter. BCRP is an efflux transporter. And all these other transferases are influx transporters. So in addition to the diffusion, there are also active uh, transport going on, pushing the drug either toward the fetal compartment or back to the maternal compartment. And where this has become very helpful, again, is in terms of setting up uh, clinical trials to pick drugs which either will, will go through the placenta, if that's what you have in mind to treat the fetus, or drugs that will stay in the maternal compartment. So this is a study of pravastatin. This is one of those maternal conditions. Uh, it's induced by pregnancy, and it's called preeclampsia. Um, eclampsia is actually uh, seizures caused by very high blood pressure in the, in the mother. Preeclampsia is a condition where the blood pressures are elevated, and it seems to be caused, although it's not exactly clear, uh, by endothelial damage and inflammation. And pravastatin, which was initially um, developed to reduce blood cholesterol, also has the properties of reducing inflammation and treating this endothelial dysfunction. So after using this placental perfusion model to determine whether pravastatin would actually cross into the fetal compartment from the maternal compartment, and many months of discussion with the Food and Drug Administration, it was determined that um, under I investigational new drug application, a study could go forward comparing placebo to 10 milligrams of pravastatin for women <clears throat> who had previously experienced preeclampsia and where it was desirable to prevent preeclampsia. And you can see that these results are pretty clear. Maternal outcomes. Preeclampsia in the placebo group, there were four of them. In the pravastatin group, zero. Severe features of preeclampsia, three in the placebo group, zero in the pravastatin group. So this is a practical application of the use of the um, placental perfusion model. So our research questions about placental function include, how does placental function change during pregnancy? How is placental function affected by disease, such as gestational diabetes mellitus, preeclampsia, and so on? And how can these questions be addressed safely by non-invasive methods? And what is the role of animal models? Again, I don't have any answers for these questions, but they certainly are research questions that come up. Okay, next I wanted to talk briefly about fetal pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic changes during gestation. Again, these are sort of hard to get at. Um, renal function at birth is very low. The creatinine clearance, or excuse me, the glomerular filtration rate is typically about 10% of the adult value. Hepatic phase one enzymes uh, are typically extremely low at birth. And fetal hepatic phase two enzymes, for example, uh, for glucuronidation, are also extremely low. The practical application of this has to do with chloramphenicol. So uh, chloramphenicol has been around since the 1950s. And in 1959, there was an interesting paper in the New England Journal showing that there was an increased mortality rate in preterm infants uh, who had prolonged uh, rupture of uh, membranes who were treated with chloramphenicol. And what they figured out was that this uh, extremely low amount of glucuronidation, low renal function, had actually been the cause of these deaths, these gray baby deaths. So there is the practical application of, of why it's important to recognize that uh, fetal hepatic function, renal function is very low, and that uh, there need to be dosage adjustments made for neonates, particularly preterm neonates, uh, when they're being treated with medications. Okay, next I wanted to talk about maternal treatment for a fetal condition. And I wanted to start with uh, supraventricular ventricular tachycardia. So SVT is a 
it's a fairly rare condition, uh, but it can lead to fetal uh, death if the heart rate is not controlled. Uh, the fetus will go into heart failure and die. So I wanted to point out a couple of things. So first of all, it is possible to treat a fetus for a fetal condition using the mother as sort of the vehicle to transmit the drug. This study was done actually over the course of 10 years. It was published in 2011, uh, but the data collection in a non-randomized fashion, so this was not a randomized controlled trial, this was just uh, standard of care. Uh, showed that the women who received flecainide um, showed a better fetal response in terms of decrease in heart rate than the digoxin or the sotalol arms. And another example of using uh, the mother to transmit drug to the fetus is the issue of uh, preterm labor and um, decreased uh, pulmonary function and decreased surfactant production in preterm infants. And I thought this was a quite interesting uh, trajectory of uh, scientific thought. So 1953, influence of pituitary adrenal system on the differentiation of phosphatase in the duodenum of the suckling mouse. Okay. 1968, we moved to fetal rabbits. And then the uh, very well-known paper by the Liggins group about fetal lambs infused with glucocorticoids and the theory that there perhaps was <clears throat> induction of accelerated appearance of surfactant activity. Okay, so that's, that brings us to 1969. 2017, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology puts out a position opinion on the use of antenatal corticosteroid therapy for fetal maturation, which has clearly become the standard of care. A single course of betamethasone is recommended for pregnant women between 34 and 07 weeks and 36 and 6 7 weeks of gestation at risk of preterm birth within seven days and who have not received a previous course of antenatal corticosteroids. And this unfortunately is the drug label for betamethasone. So despite the fact that there have been five or six decades worth of research on the use of antenatal corticosteroids, either dexamethasone or betamethasone, uh, to induce surfactant production, uh, there is certainly a lag in the drug labeling. I wanted to talk briefly about drugs and breast milk. Um, drugs and other substances transferred from maternal circulation to breast milk are transferred by diffusion and active transport mechanism. So if you refer back to the slide about the placenta, these are the same kinds of uh, manner through which drugs uh, go into breast milk. Lipid solubility, the more lipid soluble the drug, the more likely it will end up in breast milk. Protein binding, again, drugs that are highly protein bind will probably not wind up in breast milk. Molecular weight, larger molecular weight compounds will not be uh, uh, transferred into breast milk. And drugs that are ionized also will not transfer very well into breast milk. But there are also active transport mechanisms, similar as uh, we saw in the liver, in the kidney, in the placenta. Now, what I wanted to point out here was that the amount of drug that's ingested by the, uh, the breastfeeding infant is equal to the concentration of the drug in the breast milk times the volume. This is a standard equation. However, the amount of the drug ingested, in other words, swallowed by the infant, is not the amount of drug absorbed. And the amount of drug absorbed has to do with the maturity of the intestinal epithelium, excuse me, the hepatic metabolism, in other words, as the neonate becomes an infant, the hepatic metabolism picks up, and so there'll be increased metabolism and uh, less uh, drug exposure, and also renal clearance. The reason I bring this up is there's been a lot of um, news about the use of codeine in breastfeeding, and the very specific issue here is that uh, codeine and other narcotics are metabolized to morphine. That's how they work. However, there have been occasional rare but unfortunate cases where the mothers had a CYP2D6 ultra-rapid rapid metabolizer genotype, <clears throat> where the mother, instead of uh, metabolizing, let's say, 10% of the codeine to morphine, was suddenly metabolizing 50% or 60% or 70% of the codeine to morphine. And this has created 
uh, sedated infants. Uh, there have been a couple of rare cases of infant fatalities. Um, so I just wanted to point out that there, there are issues around codeine and the um, rare but uh, serious cases of uh, ingestion of increased amounts of, of morphine in uh, CYP2D6 ultra rapid metabolizers. So in terms of our research questions for fetal pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and pharmacogenomics, are how do fetal pharmacokinetics change and by what mechanisms throughout gestation? And how would you be able to figure that out? How do fetal pharmacodynamics change and by what mechanisms during gestation? And what are the fetal pharmacogenomics which affect the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics? The other question is what happens when there is illness, when there are medical conditions? So how do maternal or fetal conditions affect fetal pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, pharmacogenomics, fetal reprogramming, and what are the long-term effects on growth and development? How can fetal pharmacology be studied safely and non-invasively throughout gestation? And what is the role of animal models? How can medicines be developed for fetal conditions? And what short and long-term outcome measures should be considered in drug development? In terms of drug exposure in the embryo and the fetus and the infant, what is the exposure? What is the risk of the exposure? Are we worried? Are we not worried? During what embryotic or fetal period is the exposure occurring? What are the short and long-term consequences of this drug exposure? And if the mother does not treat her medical condition because of concern of infant exposure, what are the short and long-term consequences for the mother and the infant? And again, these are very complicated questions, but I, I think that they should be raised. Now, a lot of the underlying issue about the lack of drug development or drug treatment for the pregnancy-induced conditions that we talked about in the first couple of slides are the issue of drug-induced birth defects. This is a paper from 2015 showing the baseline rate of fetal malformations. Now, they weren't corrected for anything, but at baseline, in the United States, there's about a 3% uh, congenital malformation rate at baseline. But what no one wants to repeat is two complete disasters. The first one was drug-induced birth defect by thalidomide. It was developed for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. It was marketed originally in Germany in 1950. The off-target effect was blood vessel angiogenesis growth inhibition, and the toxicity was focomelia. So we see this beautiful little girl with no arms. And that's the one thing that nobody wants to repeat because the, uh, the animal studies showed no toxicity, but then you wind up with human toxicity. Another example, diethylstilbestrol, DES. The indication was for prior pregnancy loss on the theory that if you increase the mother's estrogen concentrations, the chance of pregnancy loss would decrease. This was marketed between 1940 and 1975 and it was in the cattle feed supply in the U.S. through the 1970s. The off-target effect was as an endocrine disruptor, and the toxicity came out about 1971 when there were these odd reports of vaginal clear cell carcinoma, which was vanishingly rare, but suddenly was increased. And after looking around to figure out what the causative agent could be, it seemed that a lot of the, the women that were presenting with these vaginal clear cell carcinomas, their mothers had received DES during their pregnancy. However, this also causes urogenital anomalies in boys, and even though in humans they've been looking into the second generation just because of the timing for this, in the rodent model these uh, abnormalities are still continuing through the third generation in rodents, and it remains to be seen whether this will continue in humans as well. This is a slide about ACOG recommendations for chronic hypertension in pregnancy, and I wanted to point out two things. Um, the first one is that methyl dopa, which is uh, listed third on common oral antihypertensive agents in pregnancy, uh, lists methyl dopa. Methyl dopa has been around since probably the 1950s, maybe earlier than that. Um, its main advantage is that it appears to be safe and doesn't seem to cause any um, 
uh, congenital anomalies. However, one of its major side effects is um, depression, which is not a desirable effect in pregnancy. The other thing I wanted to point out is that on the bottom on the left, the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers are associated with fetal anomalies and contraindicated in pregnancy and the preconception period. However, the reason that we know this is because of post-marketing studies and epidemiologic studies. So it would have been nice to know uh, in a more mechanistic uh, toxicology fashion that these were going to be potential problems. So questions to consider in obstetric drug development include what is the clinical condition in the pregnant woman that requires treatment? Is there a condition during pregnancy mechanistically similar to a condition occurring outside of pregnancy? In other words, is preeclampsia similar to hypertension because that's how it's being treated for the most part? Is gestational diabetes mellitus similar to type 2 diabetes mellitus? And is preterm labor similar to an asthma attack because they're both being treated with beta agonists? So clearly, if preterm labor is not an asthma attack, it would be nice to have other drugs being developed uh, for this indication. Is there sufficient basic science research investigating the disease mechanism? I would probably argue no. Has the basic research provided any drug targets? And is the pregnant woman the same as a non-pregnant woman in terms of drug concentration, time course, and drug effect? And I think we've seen over the last bit that that is not the case. So the research needs in this area are many. Uh, there's a lack of basic science on disease mechanisms in pregnancy. There's a need for basic science on placental and breast milk drug transport. There's a lack of me mechanistic approach to preclinical toxicology and off-target effects of drugs. There's a lack of, developmental, of development excuse me, of novel drug targets applicable to pregnancy and lactation, including development of placental drug transporter inhibitors. There is a need for a better understanding of placental transport and countertransport with novel ways of assessing immature placental function. This is especially an issue because um, most of the information we have about placental function is on the full-term placenta and also on the full-term healthy placenta. Uh, there is a need for meaningful, feasible, validated, accepted short-term and long-term clinical trial outcome measures that was reflective in the uh, study of treatment of uh, SVT in the fetus, uh, where that was not a randomized controlled trial and took 10 years to accrue the number of patients that they did for publication. And there's a need for improved feasibility of clinical trial designs in pregnancy to allow more pregnant women and lactating women to be enrolled in clinical trials. Thank you very much for your attention, and I appreciate any questions or discussion you may have. Feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you very much.